one of the things that you're credited with is to bring major sponsors one of be the first one to bring major sponsors uh to fifa and pretty much help them change their model right so in the late 70s don't know if fifa was broke uh at that time or as it was a very small federation i don't remember how many staff uh, they had but probably would compare to a very small international federation at the moment and suddenly there is this opportunity to bring uh, big sponsors uh, to to sign with them global contracts that has never been done before. How did that come about? Well, again, it, 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 more by accident than by design. Uh, my client was the Coca-Cola company, and I was aware that the Coca-Cola company was concerned that its global in image was very much linked, linked to, to American and American military because the distribution of Coca-Cola around the world really happened because it went alongside uh, the American military. So I knew that Coca-Cola was interested in looking at a, a PR program, if you like. And there again, I said to Peter, look, this is a perfect opportunity to where sport could contribute to what it is that they need to integrate with governments, to integrate with local people. Let's take the world sport of soccer, and let's teach the Africans, the Asians soccer. Let's teach the Koreans, the Japanese, the Americans, the Australians. Uh, the, the world obviously were uh, open to us to actually teach the sport. We actually were looking for the right program at the time that uh, Dr. Avalanche became elected with FIFA. He was um, had a mandate where he wanted to teach the world more of the sport. So the two things seem to meet each other at a very, very opportunistic time. So we wrote and prepared what became the FIFA Coca-Cola development program. We secured the relationship with Coca-Cola. We went looking for people that could run it because as you say, FIFA back then was a modest organization. I think they only had five or six permanent staff. They had rented offices in Zurich and basically a bankrupt sort of organization. So Mr. Blatter, we found out of Longines to come in to, to front up the program for us within FIFA. So we started this whole program, which became very successful into Africa and Asia. At this time, this was around 75, 76, I was aware that the World Cup was going to be in Argentina in 1978. I didn't realize there was going to be a military coup in Argentina around that time, which, of course, there was. But I obviously asked then the General Secretary, Dr. Kayser at FIFA, how are we going to give your uh, sponsor, Coca-Cola, my client, Coca-Cola, a very, very good presence at the World Cup in Argentina? The simple answer was they didn't know, because as far as they were concerned, they passed all the responsibility of hosting the event to the organizers. So when I said, who has the rights to pour the drinks in the stadium? Who has control of the advertising in the stadium? Who controls the mascot and symbols? Uh, in the end of the day, oh, we don't know. You'd have to talk to the local organizers. Well, of course, the local organizers suddenly change because after the Perron people were ousted, here we had was the military junta. As a young man, I was sent off to Buenos Aires in uh, 76 at the time of the Olympics to literally negotiate with the military junta to say, look, if you want the World Cup to come to your country, we're going to have to change the ground rules. You're going to have to give back to me, to FIFA, control of all the rights. We want clean stadia. We want control of the soft drink supply. We want the merchandising, licensing, mascots, symbols. We want total exclusivity so that we could offer our primary client, Coca-Cola, a very exclusive opportunity to be associated with this brilliant World Cup. We wanted the young players from around the world that have been in the Coca-Cola soccer skills programs to be able to be on the field of play. All of that sort of early days of bringing young people to the event. So to my surprise was that the military junta were well aware of the image that Argentina had at that time. You know, it was bad. It, they were aware of it. And to my absolute surprise, instead of finding a resistance, I was embraced. They embraced the concept. They even agreed with me to get rid of the military uniforms for the people that will be at the stadium and put them into Adidas three-stripe uh, uniforms to, to make the whole sport a sporting occasion. So rather than it being difficult, 
it was extremely well accepted. And if you like, Argentina almost became a partner of ours in taking this new concept forward. What I did then was that FIFA had no money. So I got my client Coca-Cola to fund it. I agreed with Coca-Cola that we would split the revenues as the revenues came in. 70% of that money went back to meet the overheads of that whole project. We then started talking to other clients, a client I had with Philips, with Canon. I even worked with Cafe de Brazil um, back in those days. And I brought other corporates to come to share in a limited way and then lots of other stadium advertisers in an old sense. And it was very successful. In the end of the day, it cost Coca-Cola nothing. So it was extremely successful in doing a number of things. One, showing to FIFA by packaging and managing your rights, it could be extremely successful. Two, it showed that companies were beginning to look at global opportunities to get exposure on what was then state broadcasters, which was significant. So if you like, by accident more than by design, we'd created the whole appeal of this exclusive approach to a major international sporting event. The next problem, of course, was that Avalanche wanted to go from 16 teams in Argentina to 24 teams in Spain, and therefore the whole financial expectation with 14 stadiums as opposed to four, um, building uh, TV centers that were capable of additional broadcasters, the money level went up which was when I thought, well, we now have to make it really exclusive. We just need a limited number of, say, eight companies that would equally share the financial ticket that I needed to raise. So basically, I created InterSoccer, which was then also the same program I was creating for the Olympics and other things. And InterSoccer really was what cemented the whole concept of this global packaging, and it still runs today.